I grew up in a house that was sort of submerged in arts events and so there was often supper parties and as a child I remember really clearly the you know, I had to go to bed when I was really little and so it was that noise and the hubbub and stuff out in the room and there was all the smell of cooking late at night and there was the smell of cigarette smoke which I forever associate with these sorts of supper parties and it was there at the night time and it was there when you got up in the morning. It was a different world. You could probably sort of like burn a cigarette like an incense stick in the corner just to remember the good old days. Tonight up we're going to see the cheese rolls which I really want to show you start to finish because they're just magnificent. Um, and my absolute personal favourite is the prunes wrapped up in bacon and cooked in the oven. Those just... Which is going to make a fabulous casserole slash stew. And then we're going to wind the whole thing up and have a fantastic pav based dessert. And it's just going to be a smashed up mess of stuff in plastic disposable cups. You know, we'll just be like everybody and we'll get on to worrying about the planet tomorrow. But before that, we're making savouries with bereavement caterers. We'll compose a stew with a great New Zealand poet and we'll watch perhaps New Zealand's most experienced pav maker in action. For supper parties, we've come to Auckland, and these supper parties of the 60s and 70s were up here at a time when Sir Dubmire Robinson was mayor of Auckland. The biggest attraction in town was the farmer's car park, and uh, there was a war on in Vietnam. These were the days when people hadn't heard of pesto, can you believe it? And everybody was going to supper parties. They were serving things like sausage rolls, little mince savouries, bread cases with cream corn in them, there was definitely bacon on mouse traps. People were drinking cold duck and blue nun. One of my favourite really badly thought out ideas is one where they take a slice of salami, put it in the oven until it dries out and curls up on the side and then just put a teaspoon of boiled peas in the middle. And they were putting cheese and pineapple on toothpicks and shoving them into oranges and creating little hedgehogs. I mean all they were trying to do was find yet another colourful snack food and some of it was really terribly misguided. So we're going to see a woman who single-handedly wrote the style guide for stylish entertaining in New Zealand in the 1960s and 70s. Tui Flower, nutritionist and long-serving food editor of the New Zealand Women's Weekly. People have always had supper parties that was a way of entertaining. Keep in mind before your, your um, licensed restaurants, people entertained at home. So in the 1960s, 70s, what were the sort of most popular savouries, do you think, at parties? Well, they'd be having the, the, the sorts of things that uh, are, are apparent even now, things like sausage rolls, uh, pastry cases with various fillings, uh, maybe salmon or sweet corn. Over your long career of helping New Zealanders have better parties, you, you know, what are the changes? Changes have come with mainly with things like the availability of uh, different ingredients. I'm well known for saying that my readers, when I first started the Women's Weekly, I used to get people terribly agitated because I had the cheek to use garlic, oil and wine, and certainly for the garlic and oil it was, why are you using that foreign muck? So you'd find those kind of savouries at bowls afternoon teas, 21sts, PTA functions, rugby club aftermatch functions, and of course the ultimate aftermatch function of them all, funerals. Bronwyn Richardson and Jodie Woolley have been catering funerals for 15 years and they've hardly changed the menu in all that time. We believe the traditional foods are what people want and expect at such an occasion and it just evokes memories from days gone by it's what mum would have liked and and just provides that comfort food that's not going to shock anyone it's tried and true i want to find out about the old savouries and i can go to plenty of caterers who can show me how to make um, some sort of fancy italian stuff on top of crostini or whatever but nobody seems to really have the skills to make large quantities of good old-fashioned savouries. It's no use giving people what they don't expect and don't want. So if you want to make eight dozen cheese mini muffins, take two cups of milk, three eggs, three cups of self-raising flour, half a kilo of cheese, 600 grams of onion and 250 grams of bacon. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking that it's like a muffin with a whole lot more stuff on it. Absolutely, so absolutely. And decorate them. Another one of their most popular nibbles is pinwheel savouries. 
While the cheese muffins and pinwheels bake in a moderate oven for 20 minutes, I take a look at their back catalogue. Well, look, in here, my favourite sausage rolls. The thing I really liked about their food was the scale of it and the sort of great generous platters, but the small pieces of sausage rolls just brilliant because I think what's happened with poor old sausage rolls is they've felt everybody's attention slipping away towards salmon on this and that and the other thing. And so the, and to co compensate, the sausage rolls have just got bigger and bigger and bigger going, look at me, look at me. And um, that's really not how a sausage roll should be. One bite. That was perfect. Well, and this is the new um, tomato sauce, isn't it? No, no, actually, what well, it is really isn't it? Well, that's actually a mild chilli and ginger sauce. Mm. Um, so again, for those people that want to be a little bit more adventurous, they can take your more traditional foods and, and use the different sauce. You'd have to be very careful to put it mild in case it's Nana mild. had a so top of her head shops. pop off in the middle of the funeral. That wouldn't work, would it? Okay, so this is a cheese puff with a bit of red pepper. It's cheesy yes, it is. and delicious. Yes, it is. That's a great <laughs> recipe. These are very good. They're just everything a pinwheel should be. Great. Cheesy, oniony, tomatoey. Mm. Well, heavens above. There's a hell of a lot to get through here. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll just settle down and loosen my shorts and get eating. <laughs> Coming up after the break, casserole. Supper menu continues with casserole, and it's very clear from all of the readings that we've done that um, casserole has been around ever since people have been eating and cooking, you know, applying heat to food to cook it. Crock pot was the thing that really kind of catapulted casserole to its sort of pinnacle when everybody suddenly, and probably in the end, caused its demise because I think that somehow when there was a device which was sitting in the kitchen specifically to make casserole and cluttering up the bench, then everybody finally got sick and tired of the bloody crock pot and hiffed it out the back and then they forgot they could make it any other way. A lot of people ask me if, as a short answer to why casserole is such a great New Zealand dish, but I reckon that the answer, like the casserole itself, is long-winded. It's just a good old-fashioned kiwi stew. You just can't beat it. Kevin Ireland, poet, painter, casserole maker. It's the simplest kind of cooking. That's why I do it, and that's, I think, why uh, a lot of men enjoy cooking uh, casseroles, because you can throw everything in and just leave it, walk away. We're going to chop up the meat. It's a piece of top side because that's so lean, but it holds together. You don't want to yep. use your best fillet steak mm. for a stew. Just something that will, it's tough enough to hold. But yeah. One of the nice things about a stew is flinging the ingredients in. <laughs> you see, you just fling it in. <laughs> Along with the meat, fling in some onions, a bay leaf, parsley, thyme, and some olive oil. The nice thing about a stew is that you can be very approximate with the ingredients. You don't have to be exact. It's not like cooking a sponge. Mm. So I just sort of do roughly, you know, sort of, ah, oh, that's about, what do you reckon? Oh, a bit more. You know, a good dosing. You, you mustn't be miserable with mm. the ingredients. You know, mm. you've got to be generous. We're making a marinade. Look at that now. Mm. That's, you know, get your fingers in. People are frightened by the naming of the dish. That's right. If you call it beef bourguignon, mm. people are intimidated. Yep. If you call it red wine stew... Mm. <laughs> that sounds like a lot simpler. Ah, that's right, I think I can yep. do that. <laughs> marinate for at least two hours, but if you can, six. You'd have to try very hard to murder a stew. <laughs> that's why, yep. you know, I'm good at stew. Yep. <laughs> you know. I had supper parties here in the 70s and a lot of them in London when I was there. I'm nostalgic about it. I think it was a great, great time, great social time. Mm. Uh, and I'm, I'm sorry it's gone. Stage two of Kevin's stew, he sautés bacon and mushrooms and sets those aside. He dries the meat thoroughly and browns it adds two tablespoons of flour and browns that, then adds a packet of stock. In we go. The mushrooms and bacon, the marinade, bouquet garni, one clove of garlic crushed, and he simmers it on top of the stove for two hours. Here comes the red wine stew. Yeah. Oh, there we are. 
That smells so good. Yum. Richard. Oh, cheers. Very good health. Mm. It's very brown and rich and round and big and meaty and delicious and well, you, you're the wordsmith. <laughs> Give me some more. Don't... I can't add to that. That's wonderful. <laughs> I'm very flattered. <laughs> that was very good. His Kevin stew was very, very good. I mean, I... almost as <laughs> was better than mine. Well, thank you very, very much, Kevin, for making this absolutely wonderful stew for us. It's... Well, thank you for yeah. giving me an excuse to make one. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to go and find ourselves an expert pav maker. It's an Australian and New Zealand dessert, and there's been some kind of issues over whether it's a New Zealand dessert or an Australian dessert. It was named, incidentally, after the famous Russian ballerina Anna Pavlova, who toured Australia and New Zealand in 1926. The Australians have always said it's theirs, and we've always sort of said it's ours, but fortunately we have academics, and they've spent an awful lot of time researching in great detail, sifting through many, many recipe books, and they've found the evidence that proves, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that it's a New Zealand dish, it appears in New Zealand recipe books, long before it appears in any Australian books, although some people have suggested that that is because at that stage Australians hadn't learned to write. Now we can claim the PAV, I think we can be more relaxed about the fact that we have to give away the lamington to the Australians and we have shared custody of the Anzac biscuit, which is as it should be. Debbie Maguire grew up on a chicken farm and has been making PAVs for 33 years. It's a dessert that's really well liked, but I'm not sure how popular it is that people are actually still making them all the time, like it becomes quite an event when you front up with one. Right, well let's make right. a pan. Okay. Debbie, let's do it. First, beat six egg whites. So it's still got some moisture in it, just, you can tell it's going to peak if you put a spoon in there. For six eggs, we're putting in one and a half cups right. of sugar. Now this is important. Add the sugar one dessert spoon at a time, letting it beat in before adding the next. It could take about 10 minutes. Probably only added about half a cup. Um, but it starts getting a nice gloss on it. Now, is it Australian or New Zealand? Well, well the good news is, is it's been proven to be New Zealand. Working but it out. In order to get have, we had to give away lamingtons. Oh, is that theirs? Yeah. But well, these are much easier to make, anyway. <laughs> and they're, a bit, right. they're a bit more impressive yeah. at a dinner. That's a really good point, yeah. those bloody Aussies <laughs> over there now, and they're all covered in chocolate. chocolate icing and coconut all over their fingers, going, shit, if only we'd got the pan. That's really thick and glossy, sort of like a fashion model. All you do is fold in just a little bit of ingredient and then you're done. Four and a half teaspoons of corn flour, one and a half teaspoons of white vinegar. Fold one. this in and then you just build the pavlo. Wow, that's the, the fun part. The shape that you want. Preheat your oven to 150, then when you put your pav in, turn it down to 120. Cook for one hour, then turn your oven off and take the pav out when the oven's cold. Let's not go to the table, let's just eat it now. Here, shall we? Do you want to have a piece of it? Yeah, yeah, right now. It does look good, doesn't it? Hurry. Okay. <laughs> it's, so, it's so damn good. Well, no going back now, I've got to eat it. That's a really, really good pad. Richard, you say that almost seriously. <laughs> it's good, isn't it? Mm. It's a serious business. Thinking a pav, this is no light-hearted matter. How can you describe the flavour? It's very pav. I mean, it's, it's crunchy. A it's, thing, it's, isn't it? a, yeah, it's textural and, and it's sweet and it's it's the texture. It's the mixtures of the crunchy on the outside and the gooey on the inside and the softness and pillowiness of the cream and then the fruit, the tang and stuff of the passion fruit and the the blueberries and you know, oh, very fond of this. Very fond. Right, well, thank you very much for having us and showing us how to make a pav, Debbie. That's all right, Richard. All right. Really enjoyed doing it. And so after the break, I'm going to be in my kitchen, and that is if I'm not still here eating pav, and I'll be cooking if I'm not still here eating pav. <laughs> Our 
<laughs> okay, so here I am in my kitchen and I'm going to do my absolute utmost to convince you that it's incredibly easy to entertain 20 people in fine form with hundreds of different savouries. It doesn't sound possible, but it is. We're going to start off with a rolled up thing, not an asparagus roll. This is the great New Zealand cheese roll. The thing I like about the cheese roll is that it's kind of a combination of one of the New Zealand's great favourites, which is the onion dip into sort of toasted sandwich form. And so first thing you do is to uh, make um, onion dip. Does anybody out there need me to explain that? Or <laughs> oh, you're all copesthetic with the dip. And then I'm going to add a little bit of onion to that because I can. A precisely measured tablespoon or thereabouts, or actually probably more like half a tablespoon of mustard powder just to sharpen the whole thing up. Add the mixture to 300 grams of grated cheese. Then you get bread slices. You can take the crusts off, but I think the crusts on adds a lot of crunch to the outside. Butter the bread slices and then on the unbuttered side put some filling. A good tip, don't overfill them. So you carry on making a whole bunch of those. All I need to do now is just sort of cover these with a tea towel and set them aside somewhere. And when the time comes, put them into a moderate oven for 20 minutes. I think it pays also, I'll just mention it now because we'll all be drinking later and eating, that you want to get them out of the oven and let them sit somewhere for a while or otherwise you'll have a whole lot of people going, Aah! and they'll have burny cheese in their mouth and, you know, it's not a good look. Right, well, I'll make another savoury for you. This one's an absolute favourite of everybody on the entire planet. And um, it's just so damned easy. Prunes, bacon, roll. These ones, they're called um, devils on horseback with the prunes. And then you put an oyster in the middle, it's an angel on horseback. And if you put a scallop in bacon, then it's just called delicious. But these are my favourite of a whole lot of them. They're just so damn good. I'd be really surprised if anybody else gets one. So now I'm going to make my casserole. I'm going to make it very like Kevin's. I'm going to make a beef one. And I'm going to use shin for mine. And this is a big, handsome bit of hmm, cow shin. The collagen in here, all the, all the way through, all that connective tissue, the collagen, which a lot of you people get injected into your lips these days, it also breaks down in the moist cooking and makes it gelatinous and sticky and gooey and just too delicious for words. Cut up the meat, toss in seasoned flour and brown in a hot pan. Transfer the meat into the casserole and then brown the vegetables. Deglaze the pan with wine. I'm going to put in, well, more wine just because than Kevin did. I'll put in just one measure. That's a bottle and I'll need a little bit more liquid, but I am making it for a lot more, so it's probably proportionally the same. I'm just pouring some chicken stock in. OK, so now I've got to tip all that vegetable, wine, chicken stock in there, and I'm going to... Pan's hot, I'll need my tea towel. And before I get it too filthy, I'd like to show you tea towel of the week, which is the Auckland City tea towel here with Queen Street, Albert Park, the bridge, and One Tree Hill here. They've cut the tree down now, so they're going to replace that with Nicky Watson in the new issue of the tea towel. So it's a lovely one. I'm very fond of it. Add whole pickling onions and mushrooms. So it's going to go into the oven at 180, which I think is the perfect temperature for this, because if you put it in any hotter than that, all the muscle tissue is going to go tough. And it just takes time to melt down the meat and to make it tender and delicious. You've got to have that temperature. You've got to have it in there for a good length of time. If you don't have time to make this, I'm putting it in there for five hours. If you don't have that much time, just do something else. A chicken's a good idea. My pav dessert, it's quite simple, you just give it a bit of a biff. And then we're going to throw that and all this fruit here, the blackberries or whatever, just whatever fruit you can get. I've got passion fruit, and I've got strawberries, and I've got blueberries, and I've also got marshmallows, and it's all going to go in there, and I'm going to stir it all up with some whipped cream. Clearly going to have to find myself a bigger bowl for this. You can't just keep on stirring it endlessly because you'll either turn it to butter or smash the fruit up and you'll just have a mess. This is supposed to be for 20. I think it's actually for about 200. <laughs> 
you guys should all come over. Quickly, hurry. Or alternatively, it could be an intimate dinner for two, a bowl each. Okay, that's great. Stew's in the oven. All the savouries are ready to go in the oven. I've just got to go and get the room ready for everybody. Stereo on, lights on, that sort of thing. I find a great deal of joy in mass-producing savouries, Henry Ford style. I've only shown you two, but if... People hadn't arrived for the party, I'd probably still be making them. There's a couple of bread case ones here, mushroom and sort of savoury cheese ones, and little quiches with shrimps on top. I don't know what happened there. Chicken sandwiches, got to have those. Volivants, these have got a chicken curry mixture in. Goodness knows what I was thinking. Meatballs, chicken liver pate, and... These things, these are my personal snack. I don't think they'll make it through to the other room. Prunes and bacon, yum. And then toasted cheese rolls. And my casserole, my main course. Got all these lovely little old Tamuka plates from the second hand shop to put it on and, oh boy. I actually think Kevin would even like this one. It's, well, it's rich and, Sticky, and oh goodness, it's delicious. I've made a wee rice dish there to go with it. That should satisfy any vegetarians who can't manage all this stuff too. And Well, hell, I'm going to have one of these cheese rolls before those guys get onto their, get their claws into them all. Mm. Crunchy, cheesy, oniony. Mm, it's everything you want in the savoury. So anyway, thanks for coming by Kiwi Kitchen. I better take these through before I eat the lot. Cheers. Cheese roll. Mm -hmm. There's nobody leaves till the food's eaten. Cheese. cheese rolls. Yes, they're a feature dish. <laughs> 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 Why it works. <laughs>